Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, June 3rd, and this is the weekly market update. The disclaimer, anything that you hear or see on this podcast or video is not to be taken as investment advice. This information is for informational purposes only. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. Okay, so um, the In Gold We Trust annual uh, package came out. It's like 417 slides or pages. Uh, basically, it's put out by this Ronnie Stoffel and uh, his colleagues. I can't pronounce the name of this firm, Increte, Incrementum. Uh, but anyways, they put this out every year for many years, and it has a lot of good information in it. I'm going through it now reading through it i just pulled a couple couple charts in a in a snippet or one chart in a snippet the one thing I, I was amazed by i just was reminded by when i saw this chart about qe and the fed's balance sheet and i remember when qe1 under bernanke was put into effect going way back to like 2008 something like this and it was going to be a temporary facility right it was going to be temporary We'll eventually unwind it. We have to do this, yada, yada, yada. And many, um, many people that were longtime market observers, Austrian economists, rational people said that once you start down this road, you won't be able to reverse it. Um, once you, you know, don't allow the, you know, basically what happened is you have the great financial crisis. And the government and the Federal Reserve feel like they have to step in and stop the pain because of the, um, you know, the suffering or whatever votes or whatever their justification was in their minds. And so you don't ever really go through the creative destruction process and clear out all the malinvestment. The uh, natural, you know, clearing out of the dead brush culling of the herd, if you will, the bankruptcies and the, you know, realignment of assets that happens from poor managements to better managements to malinvestment to good investment. None of this happens because it's short circuited by basically for political reasons. Uh, and so now, you know, once you start down this path, you can't ever stop. And so you see, what I think is interesting here is these projections that were made about how you know these were going to be temporary and then you see these red lines or these other lines these were projections about how, how the quantitative easing was going to be unwound and you note that it never gets unwound there may be periods where it starts to you know roll over but that's just until the next crisis the next thing that breaks and then it's right back to the old playbook and so this is why you see the balance sheet you know over eight trillion, and why people like uh, Felix Zuloff, uh, you know, have said that why not? You know, he 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 doesn't see any reason why the balance sheet couldn't be you know twenty, thirty, forty trillion by the end of this decade. And so why not? Right? Uh, as long as these folks don't see a you know fall in the dollar or any real big negative feedback. Um, they can justify doing this. But you note that every projection that was made about how this was going to unwind, it does start to unwind. They do start to do quantitative tightening or pulling in, trying to bring in the balance sheet. But that, because we are in this, you know, debt-based economy uh, that with all this malinvestment and all of this, you know, compounding of error on top of error, uh, it doesn't take long once you turn the liquidity off before the malinvestments and other other things start to blow up. And then because, you know, it's like what I've talked about oversteering on an icy road, you just get bigger and bigger oversteers until you fly off the road, right? You back and forth across the road. So just letting off the gas and gliding to into the snowbank, um, taking your medicine, trying to oversteer and correct and then you have end up oversteering back and forth until you fly off the road and so that's what's going to happen here i mean 
uh, kind of goes into this next snippet, which I thought was appropriate. This is from the same um, in Gold We Trust. I think this uh, sums it up. It says, against this backdrop, the monetary policy showdown between price stability, economic activity, and financial market stability is now looming. The all-important question is, can the Federal Reserve continue its restrictive monetary policy and push inflation back down to 2%? without triggering a severe recession or a new financial crisis? Or will it have to rescue the system once more with expansive stimulative measures and then thus risk another wave of inflation? The cards must be laid on the table at the latest when the pain at the banks on the capital markets or in the real economy becomes too great. And so that's what we'll see, right? Um, the restrictive monetary policy continues, the QT continues, um, now we have bank lending contracting, getting tighter. That's an additional tightening of liquidity. Uh, and so we'll see what happens. We'll see if the economy or the financial markets contract sufficiently to panic the Fed, or if something in the economy uh, just breaks in the financial markets, uh, banks or, 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 or high yield debt, or who knows what. And then the Fed goes back to the only tool that they have, which is massively lowering rates and then reversing the QT into QE. So I don't see any way out of this. Um, I think it's fundamental to understand, for example, the whole political class is corrupted. Uh, this recent budget, so-called budget deal, um, or the debt ceiling, this is ridiculous. There is no such thing. They should just get rid of it and just do whatever they want because this is all kabuki theater. You know, I think the New York Times, it was behind a paywall, but I think the New York Times wrote about this. Even the New York Times, at the current track of accumulation of debt, we're going to be, you know, at the end of this decade, or by 2030, something in this around this realm, we're going to be at like $50 trillion in debt. And so people will say, well, we're already at 32. What's the big deal? Nothing's happened. That's right. Nothing happens until it happens. You know, a lot of people have been talking about this debt situation. I remember reading a book by a guy named, uh, his last name was Figgy. He was the chairman of Figgy International. This was like 91. He was writing about how, a book about how the debt uh, was substantially less than this. I mean, the last few presidents, they just doubled the debt during their eight year tenure. And so you can't just continue to double the debt every 10 years. It becomes an exp exponential exercise. And at some point it, it's a problem. Uh, there's absolutely no political will or catalyst or constituency for getting spending under control. It simply isn't going to happen. So what's going to happen is this is why um, Ray Dalio talks about, and I talk about buying gold. You must have a certain amount of gold to protect yourself against gov government physical irresponsibility and Federal Reserve uh, Central Bank malfeasance to cover this up. You know, Central Bank enables this. And so, you know, a lot of people would say, well, what's the alternative? If we take our medicine, we'll have a deflationary depression and who knows what. It may be to the point where we are too far down the road and we just have to kick the can until the thing blows up in our face. And that's probably what will happen more than likely because the political will is not there to make the requisite changes. I mean, you would have to do entitlement reform. That's off the table. You would have to not only freeze the defense budget, cut the defense budget by half, 90%, stuff like that. You'd have to get rid of certain government agencies. This, certain, this this isn't going to happen in the current political climate. So I anticipate that the debt will continue to grow. The issues will not, it won't be an issue till it's an issue. At some point, uh, the right circumstances will come about and it will no longer be able to continue and then it will be in your face. That's typically how these debt crises go. Now, it doesn't matter for some, you know, developing country or some small country like Greece or something. It's bad for the people living there, but everybody outside of the country, it really isn't you just look at it and go, wow, that's not good that they, you know, shut all the banks on Friday. And then when everything opens on Monday, you're screwed. You know, with currency devaluations, capital controls, can't take money out of the bank, all this nonsense. And so, you know, that's how it usually goes down. Now, it doesn't, like I said, a smaller country, it doesn't affect the rest of the world. If it happens to a country like the United States, well, the 
the effects are going to be felt in a lot of other places. So again, this isn't you know something that's actionable, but something I keep on the radar screen and I've been preaching about that you have to take this into consideration as part of your long-term financial planning. And I'm going to get into another slide from a, a, a guy that uh, I'm an acquaintance with that uh, I've talked to and interviewed, and he's interviewed me about some things that are going on in the UK now, where this is heading and why you can't be wedded to just one country. To bank, to work in a country, bank in that same country, and have all your assets in the same country is a fool's errand. You're setting yourself up for a disaster. But we'll get to that in a little bit in a presentation. So I wanted to point this out. This is uh, from the Frank Talks, US Global Investors, talking about uh, record air travel forecasted this summer, record number of air passengers expected this summer on US carriers. Uh, between June and August. So uh, you see the pandemic lows in air travel. We've come back now. Uh, I think they said a Memorial Day was the most passengers that TSA had ever um, processed. And so the reason I'm pointing this out is, is that, you know, this is where it's getting hard to kind of talk about the economy and talk about the markets because we seem to have this bifurcated, you know, we have this manufacturing recession, recession in like housing, but we're not seeing it like in the service sector or in, it's slowing down, but we're still like on this last hurrah of spending this summer. You know, Memorial Day weekend is typically the kickoff for the travel season in the U.S. vacation. Everybody's running around. And so, you know, we'll we'll have to watch how this plays out, how fuel demand, how petroleum demand, you know, uh, what happens with oil prices. This is why I'm bringing this up because uh, when I look at the data, you know, economy or economies around the world are contracting. If you look at the PMIs, we'll get into that in a minute. But you know, we still have increased air travel, increased petroleum usage. So trying to get everything to jive is getting a little bit difficult. So you're like, why? Why is the price of oil going down if supply is constrained and demand is you know holding in? Uh, difficult to uh, figure this out. Here's another chart, kind of shows the same thing. Global air traffic, weekly average includes commercial cargo, private and military. You just see 21, 22, and 23. It would have been good to show 2019, which was the pre-pandemic levels, but you see that uh, air travel is increasing every year and it is an upswing. So um, just... Uh, as we go through the summer, that's what you see as the travel season in the Northern Hemisphere kicks in. So this is, you know, another reason why you're seeing copper being a little weak recently, oil's weak, you know, recent PMI reports. Uh, this is why we have weakness in commodities. You have Eurozone manufacturing PMI fell to 44.8 from 45.8 in April. This is the steepest contraction in three years. Europe's in a recession, basically. Germany's in recession. Uh, U.S. manufacturing PMI shrank in May, sliding to 48.4 from a neutral 50.2. The JPM Morgan global manufacturing PMI recorded 49.6, just below the threshold and little change from March to April. You know, anything below 50 means that your manufacturing sector is contracting. It says uh, China was the only economy to report month on month expansion in its manufacturing sector. The CACs and PMI of private Chinese firms was 50.9 in May, marking the first positive reading in three months. I would note that the government PMI statistic is below 50 and shows contraction. And so, you know, there's some bright spots. Obviously, you know, India, has, has their PMI actually increased. So it's not like the, you know, but a lar large part of your of your world economy now is in recession, is in a manufacturing recession at least. So um, that's going to have a deleterious effect um, on commodity demand, thus prices. I'm still, you know, this is what I talk about having a cyclical downturn, a short cyclical downturn in the context of a decade long commodity secular bull market. And so have I lightened up on some things? Yes, I have. Have I recommended you do that? Yes, I have. Would I be buying right now? No, I wouldn't. Um, my global liquidity indicators, I track all the central banks around the world. Central banks are still tightening. 
that's the majority. Uh, almost all central banks are still in tightening mode. So there's no reason at this point what we should be doing is, you know, understanding that we have a long-term problem that's going to take a decade to solve, i.e. supply, but we can have a short-term downturn in demand that uh, allows prices to drift lower. Remember, commodities are priced at the margin. So just a, a 1% uh, oversupply or undersupply can affect the price greatly. So the time to buy is at you know, maximum pessimism. When we start seeing countries cutting rates, um, reliquifying, then we will be looking to you know, uh, buy. Uh, when we see some of these PMI start to get down into the mid 40s, they start to bottom and start kicking up because, um, you know, no recession or downturn lasts forever. So uh, there will be a response eventually. We will reverse these tightening policies and, and do what they always do. Uh, and the liquidity cycle will then up turn up and then we can expect to get back into uh, more heavy into some of these resource uh, stocks. Now, have I sold everything? No, I'm not going to do that because I can't predict with 100% certainty what's going to happen. Uh, so, but I wouldn't be adding right now uh, with liquidity tightening. That also means that, you know, the stock market should, you know, suffer also. You know, as I've said before, regardless of what, what's happening in a bear market, most over 90% of the stocks are going to go down. So it doesn't really matter what the short-term fundamentals show, because as we as we have noted many times, in the short and medium term, it, it is sediment and liquidity which drives stock prices. Fundamentals will out in the end, and that's why I think you know keeping your eye on the secular long-term bull uh, in the supply-demand uh, underinvestment scenario we've laid out is important. You need to be cogs of these short-term, you know, cyclical. Uh, downturns that can happen in the business cycle, which are affect, which will have a, a have a you know outsized uh, effect on the, in the near term on these prices. So, just bringing this to your attention. So the Gordon Rosenzweig Q1 2023 resource commentary is out. I'll put links to this and the In Gold We Trust um, packages in the show notes below the video so that you can peruse it. This is one of the, this particular Gorin and Rosenzweig uh, paper that comes out every quarter. I, I, I hype it up every quarter. I love reading this thing. It's like 40 pages. And it's really talking about the, the, the title for this report for this quarter is Hubert's Peak is Here. Um, and in it, they're talking about, um, you know, the thesis that they've talked about for several years, many years actually, is the fact that the shale oil revolution has basically carried the world's growth in oil supply. Uh, Non-OPEC uh, conventional oil production has peaked a long time ago. And the shale miracle we had in the Bakken, Eagle Ford, Marcellus, and now the Permian uh, has carried the load for uh, the supply increases that were needed to keep the oil uh, world supplied with oil. And it was a miracle, but Dow is now plateauing and Hubert's peak, uh, it, you know, this is an old peak oil term, you know, King Hubert uh, was a guy worked at Shell a long time ago, I think in the fifties. And he came up with the type curves or showing that once a oil field produces 50%, I forget what the, um, what the exact axiom is, but basically he shows how Oil fields, oil wells, they all go through a basically bell curve where they initially increase production, hit the 50% produced mark, and then go into terminal decline. And that happens at the oil, individual oil well level, oil field country level. And uh, that's what's happened uh, with U.S. shale now. And so what comes after this? Because the demand for oil is still there. Shale, unconventional shale in the U.S. in those three basins um, basically carried the load for the last decade. Now what happens if they now are plateauing, which at least the data is clear on the Bakken and Eagle Fur that they have plateaued and are now in decline and the Permian is close to peaking either next year or in 2025, and then it goes into terminal decline. So what's the next magic trick after this? Uh, there isn't one that we can see. So, you know, you have... 
it'll be interesting to see, you know, with the underinvestment that's happened in non-OPEC conventional oil and unconventional around the world, uh, what that means vis-a-vis -vis oil prices as we go throughout the rest of this decade. This is part of the thesis that I have about this decade-long resource bull market that is tied to underinvestment. And, uh, you know, now that the magic show of shale is dissipating, uh, we're going to see. So a couple snippets from the article. Again, I would read it for myself if I were you. Uh, they did a lot of, uh, they've been doing a lot of work on field by field uh, artificial intelligence data mining. So it's very interesting how they came to some of these conclusions, but the data is now has supported their thesis at least in the Bakken and uh, Eagleford shales. And there's no reason to think that the Permian won't, you know, just because you have a large reserve doesn't mean that you won't eventually produce, uh, you know, it won't produce in, uh, and then plateau and then go into decline. It's not everlasting just because it's a huge resource. And so uh, that's where we're at. And I think a lot of people made that mistake. It used to crack me up during the, um, times when uh, the shale boom was really going and you would see articles i've said this before where like i'm talking about cheese head uh bleacher bum like publications like us today i remember an article about you know somebody wrote in there about u.s oil production would get to 25 million barrels a day some oil prices would go down to 20 and stay there forever it was just a lot of nonsense and so now we're seeing it because this is about geology and physics and math and you know you can't fight against these things and so when this happens what does that mean for the world uh i think it means higher prices and uh, a lot of uh, changes in people's lifestyles so here's a couple of snippets it says conventional oil production has now unequivocally rolled over unconventional production the only source of growth in global oil supply over the last 12 years has also significantly slowed the only growing non-OPEC basin is the Permian in West Texas. Never before has oil supply growth been so geographically concentrated. Six counties in West Texas are now 100% responsible for all global oil production growth. I thought that was just fascinating. And when you get in there and read it, it's just shocking, right? We're, we're basically relying on, like I said, this last prolific basin in West Texas to account for all of the world's uh, production growth going forward. Now, what will happen, obviously, is the price of oil is going to go up over time. Uh, and that will curb frivolous demand. It will also uh, incentivize people to go out and produce more oil. You know, the world has a lot of oil yet to be found and produced. It just will be done at a higher price. And so uh, that's the opportunity for us. This is why I'm so bullish on offshore oil services, uh, drilling, service providers, uh, you know, offshore service vessels, the whole shebang, because that industry has really been underinvested in. And so as they now have tried to ramp up offshore oil exploration, which has is has been happening and is happening. We're running into bottlenecks where you have like all your seventh, I think we're on the seventh generation drill ships are the most advanced, if I believe so. They're like 100% um, on lease right now. And so your, your more sophisticated, high technologically advanced rigs, they're all, you know, being being rented or leased or used. And so rates are going up and there isn't a incentive yet for various reasons to just go and build a bunch more of these things. So that's where your opportunity is. You know, if the price goes up high enough and stays high enough for a certain amount of time, these problems will get solved because that will incentivize more capital to come in and, and take advantage of those high margins. But that is not something, again, as I've said, whether it's product tankers, oil tankers, mining, offshore oil drilling, what have you, the, the, the underinvestment that has taken place for over a decade, the atrophy of these interest industries, the lack of replacing of the steel uh, is now going to come home to roost. And so, again, let me reiterate this last sentence here. 
Never before has oil supply growth been so geographically concentrated. Six counties in West Texas are now 100% responsible for all global production growth. Goes on to say, conventional non-OPEC oil production peaked in 2007 at 46.2 million barrels a day and now stands at 44 million barrels a day, 4% below its peak. Including OPEC, conventional global oil Output peaked in 2016 at 84 million barrels and now stands at 81 million barrels, 5% below its peak. Even if OPEC has its alleged 4 million barrels of unused production capacity, something we do not believe, conventional production would barely regain its 2016 peak. So, yeah, the world's looking at a problem. Now, if you were one of these people that believes that um, oil use is going away, then we don't have a problem. Uh, the decline in oil use would, you know, probably match the decline in production, but I don't believe that. I believe there's a lot of, uh, developing countries that need a lot of hydrocarbons to develop. And so I think that the price for these hydrocarbons is going to go a lot higher. And this is why you can expect more conflict in the world, not less because, uh, my suggestion is, you know, like I said, I don't think the world's going to run out of oil, but the oil that is going to be produced is going to be produced at a higher cost and in more geologically problem problemic areas. Let's put it that way, in areas where the political systems may not be aligned with the United States' view on things. So uh, this could present a problem, and this could also interfere with, you know, efficient uh, market responses to undersupply. You know, we're seeing a lot of resource nationalism around the world. We're seeing a lot of countries wake up now and say, hey, wait a minute, you're not just going to take all of our materials out of here. You're seeing countries like Indonesia that are saying, wait a minute, we're going to put export bans on ore. If you want to export copper or nickel or lithium or what have you, you need to do it in a value added manner. If you want, if you have some of the largest lithium uh reserves in the world, then you know what? You're going to go ahead and just build your battery factory here because we want those jobs here and we want that value add here. You're not just going to strip mine us and, you know, pay us a royalty and then ship the stuff somewhere else and do that value add somewhere else. So you're going to see more of that, which will hinder the supply response and be even another inflationary impulse. Uh, so there's a lot of things at play here uh, that people are not thinking about. But uh, I, I'll put a link to this. I would suggest you read it. I've read it twice already. I'll probably read it again for it to really sink in. Um, here's one of the uh, tables that uh, was provided here. It says change in, this is the change in non-OPEC production, 2006 to 2023. They have it broken down. So you see the change in non-OPEC supply from 2006 to 2015, and then two, 2015 to 2023, you see the uh, conventional production of oil and non-OPEC oil has declined in both periods. You see the Permian Basin, uh, how it's ramped up. Um, you basically see how the Permian has been carrying the load. So it's, uh, it's interesting to see uh, what's going on um, in this, uh, what happens when the Permian you know, peaks as goes into decline. So there was a big kerfluffle. There was a big news thing. There was a big opportunity this week. Uh, it was alleged uh, sometime earlier in last week that Namibia, which uh, has a fairly decent mining regime, rules and regulations, that they were going to, uh, the government was going to want to take positions in various mining projects without paying for them. This was, you know, being like, it was another situation of shoot, shoot first and ask questions later. And so a lot of the Namibian based uranium explorers took a big hit. And then, uh, you know, this is what we've talked about, you know, that some of the danger that's going to happen going forward where you're going to have more resource nationalism where countries realize, wait a minute, we're sitting on a resource base of a particular material that is in big demand and a lot of other countries can't supply this. We need to take a bigger cut of the pie. And so um, there was an initial 
discussion that the Namibian government was going to do this. Of course, people let it run in their minds. Other rumors, they were going to nationalize mines, blah, yada, yada, yada. Long story short, some of the stocks dropped pretty significantly, double digits. And then uh, later in the week, the Namibian government came out and kind of clarified this. Basically, um, Namibia has no plans to take stakes in existing gas or mineral licenses, government tells African Energy. An official spokesman has told African Energy's Windhoek correspondent that media reports saying the government could be looking to take stakes in existing mining and hydrocarbon licenses were untrue. While the, quote, possibility remains open that a certain minimum stake could be reserved in future licenses, already signed contracts are inviolable. So they're not going to, I think this makes perfect sense, right? If you already have a deal with the government, they're not going to change it. But I think any new deals are probably going to be open for higher government stakes. Uh, I would suggest that that's probably what's going to happen. So we'll see how it plays out. Uh, I would say that a lot of the stocks rebounded quite nicely. Um, I think some, from what I understand from just some of the reading I did of different people I follow, it looks like some institutional money started coming into this market in the last week or two. I mean, big money. Um, the uranium stocks rallied real hard. Uranium price, you know, we we showed the chart a couple of weeks ago, I think, maybe it was last week, where it looked like uranium was breaking out um so there's a lot of, again more positive news coming out you know the the goofballs in the US government i guess now are going to um restrict by law the importation of enriched russian uranium um which makes very little sense because we don't produce any uranium here or do very little enrichment we can't supply our own nuclear industry basically or our nuclear navy from our own uh lack of enrichment or mining, um, existing mining. We have the resources, we have the money, we have the ability, we just haven't made the investment. So we rely on here in the United States, nuclear power for 20% of our electricity. And yet, I think the last quarter production of uranium in this country was 5,000 pounds or something crazy like that. So um, yeah. If you don't, if you don't want to buy Russian enriched uranium, they'll just sell it to somebody else. They control like I think forty percent of the enrichment market, something crazy like this. I mean, and this was done like over a decade ago, where you, the Russians basically consolidated and really uh, got themselves more control of the nuclear power market um, around the world. So they have plenty of other customers in China and India and other places where actual reactors are being built. Uh, but I think it's a kind of a national security risk in a clown world type situation where the United States has a nuclear Navy. Uh, it's actual submarine missile based deterrent, which is one leg of the triad, uh, is nuclear powered. And yet we don't produce enough fuel uh, here in the United States to supply our Navy or the reactors that provide 20 percent of the U.S.'s electricity. So you tell me, I mean, I don't care what part of the aisle you're on, that needs to get fixed. You should be able to come to a <laughs> a view on that. Instead of incentivizing intermittent power and batteries, why don't you get the existing nuclear fleet taken care of? But uh, again, I'm not going to get on a soapbox. This just, again, opens up more opportunity for speculators because um, you just have to go buy it somewhere. If there's not enough, then it's musical chairs. And the U.S. could solve its own problem. You know, sending $100 billion to Ukraine, what could $100 billion do to the U.S. nuclear uh, industry as far as getting new reactors built, getting the supply chain squared away, uh, getting a common design, and setting some go uh, goals around uh, a whole nuclear value chain, uh, kind of like France did in the 70s with a public-private partnership that uh, would solve a lot of problems. But alas... Uh, you know, we're just going to not do that. Some more good news. Uh, John Quakes, follow him on Twitter. This guy blasts out every day. I mean, he stays on top of the day-to-day -day news. This is who I follow. If I, you know, he pops up uh, on my Twitter feed. And he kind of, I mean, any and every single piece of uranium news that comes out, 
he captures it and gets it on Twitter. So I uh, would behoove you to follow him. Actually, it says uh, UXC. This is one of the companies that does all the reporting for the uranium industry. It says May month end spot uranium prices are up across nuclear fuel cycle. U308 up 75 cents to 5460. Conversion up 50 cents to all time record high of 40.25. Per kilogram, UF6 up $7.25 to $183 a kilogram. Enrichment swoos up $4 to $134. Long-term U38, 308 up $2 to $55. So um, it kind of segues into this chart I wanted to show. This is a showing you, it doesn't really show the drop from the Fukushima uh, accent that happened over here, but basically this is what a typical happens in an asset as it bottoms over several years and then breaks out to the upside. This is a classic bull market uh, where you're in decline, it hits the bottom and then goes along the bottom for one, two, three, four, call it five years, and then starts moving higher, breaks out, and then you know you enter the next up cycle. So we're in a bull market uh, in in uranium um some people you know again i'm a general investor i don't uh follow every single machination of what happens i'm just gonna sit here and wait i bought a lot of my stocks back in here uh in this area so i got in cheap it's just a matter now of waiting to see how how this plays out over the next several years i suspect we're going to go material materially higher but i just wanted to show this chart because it's you know, a lot of people are always hemming and hawing and 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 I think you know uh you know why aren't the uranium stocks moving this type of thing I've went over that before I'm not going to go over it again um we're in a bull market uh you are going to see first the stocks that of companies like that actually have earnings and revenue move higher and then as more money comes in the speculative juices will then filter down to the explorers and developers, and you will get a bull market and a mania in those. That comes later, though. So just hold what you got, and it, it, it's it's coming. So this is what I want to talk about, wandering investor. I follow him. This, guy, this is a guy that just travels around the world and buys and sells real estate. He's pretty connected. Uh, Lettuce Los Maurice, pretty good guy. I've interviewed him. I've talked to him several times. Good guy. Uh, he points this out from the Telegraph, which is in the UK. It says price controls coming to Europe. Capital controls are next at some point. If you are European, do not be 100% Europe. Take some money out, diversify. And so here's what he's talking about. Um, because of the inflation and cost of living increases due to the inflationary policies that have been pursued by various central banks as the pandemic response, plus stupid regulations and uh, rules that have been put in place. We have supply problems and that causes higher prices for staple goods. Uh, and so people, this is a political problem for the ruling class. So here's the solution. Uh, just what some dummy would do in Venezuela, I guess they're gonna do in the UK now. It says, Downing Street is drawing up plans for retailers to introduce price caps on basic food items such as bread and milk to help Help tackle the rising cost of living. Ain't going to work, Rishi Sunak. You should know better. But again, this is what politicians do, right? I mean, if you put price controls on things, you have shortages. That's what you'll end up having. And so we'll see. I just laugh. You, 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 this, I think the more important thing to take away from this is to understand, again, as I said earlier in this presentation, if you work and get your salary and money or business in one country, you bank in that same country and you have all your investments in that same country, you're doing yourself a disservice and you're putting yourself at extreme risk. Um, you know, you, sh you have the ability as a U.S. citizen or most citizens around the world, you can diversify, you can buy foreign real estate, you can buy stocks in other countries, you can go set up a business there, you can buy gold coins. There's all things you can do if you're completely 100% financially tied to one country. Then this, the, the, you are you're putting yourself at risk, because this is what I expect to happen over the long term, as the financial conditions start to to bite and constrict and box in these governments. Um, you're going to see higher taxes, higher regulation, 
Uh, it's going to cause capital flight. You see it here in the United States as people leave stupid, high cost, dummy run states like California, Illinois, and New York. We're having population loss. And of course, money goes where it's treated better. People want to have a better lifestyle. And so they're going to Texas, Florida, Tennessee, you know, North Carolina and Arizona, places like that, Idaho. And, uh, you know, but eventually, uh, as those places uh, eventually get uh, taken over by wokeness and, and, and left wing dummy policies, you know, or if you're in a country like the UK now, where the conservative party is talking about introducing price controls, eventually, you know, uh, as these dummy, uh, stupid dweeb policies that don't work compound on each other, they just keep coming up with more dumb uh, policies eventually ended in capital controls. And if you're not out by then, you ain't getting out. You're ringed fence and it's too late. So something to consider. Not something you have to do in the next day or two or week, but uh, you can see over time how they're tightening the ability. I've talked about the story about how difficult it is now for a U.S. citizen to get a foreign bank account. It used to be very easy 20 years ago. It's extremely difficult now. So are a lot more difficult. So I wouldn't wait if uh, you're thinking, if you have wealth, you know, if you got 10 grand, it doesn't matter. If you have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, then you you really need to think about it. You know, you're tying yourself to one, uh, you know, and if you're naive to believe, well, it won't happen here, you're not paying attention. It already is happening. You're the frog in the proverbial pot that's being heated up. So we're getting near the end here. A couple of items. I don't say this stuff to bag on people. These are things I hope I predicted that would happen. Uh, they will continue to happen because they're policies that are bad policy and bad policy eventually uh, manifests itself. And, uh, you know, you can't get away from the truth always outs. And so when you base an industry, i.e. renewable energy on, you know, uh, incentives and force of the state, implementing certain levels of, of things you know it's not based on the profit motive and so you get a situation like this where siemens executive says wind turbine makers need cash support well why i thought we're gonna we're going to have this awesome transition it was going to create all of these jobs and all of this wealth and why so why do they need support it should be un, they should be so inundated with orders they can't fill them all so let's read what it says. This is a Reuters article. I'll put a link to it in the show notes. Big Western wind turbine makers need direct financial support to make the investments needed to aid decarbonization. Seaman Gamesa's operating chief said on Tuesday, the challenge for a turbine maker like Siemens Gamesa, a unit of German Siemens Energy, to grow is that it needs to invest billions of euros but does not have the cash flow. Well, how is this possible if we are transitioning and we have all of this, all of these orders, there should be unlimited demand. So how can they not have the cash flow? So it goes back, uh, you know, I have to read the article. There's specific reasons why I'm not going to get into right now, but uh, you can take a look at it. But this is what the um, one of these executives from Siemens said, quote, we need cash. It's all about cash, unquote. Yeah. OK, well, um, I think we should take a hard look at this because, you know, I was looking at recently Ford Motor Company was making the transition to EVs and they're losing billions of dollars. So I would suggest to you that if you want to have a viable, um, vibrant, growing economy with good paying jobs, that's long term sustainable. You can't do it off government fiat and wishful thinking. These businesses actually have to make money and they don't for some reason. And I think people should look at that and not try to understand why that is. Because if they're not making money, they're going to go away. So peak ESG news. This was an article that was behind a paywall. It might have been in Bloomberg. Uh, I was able to, I get these emails from like the Global Warming Policy Foundation. And they have links to the articles. They reprint the articles in their emails. So that's where I'm able to read a lot of these articles that are behind paywalls. Um, but anyways, this is a snippet. It's basically talking about the, the title of the article was how Germans grew sick of the greens. And this is what the reason I'm bringing this up is not again, not to pick on specific countries like Germany or anything, but this is what I said would happen. Uh, it would take time. It would take, you know, 
two by four upside the head, but that's happening now. And people are getting, you know, realizing that, you know, the things they've been told by some of these folks simply aren't true and aren't going to happen. And if they can, their, their standard of living now is, is now suffering, their quality of life is suffering. And so now the politicians that are advocating for those policies are going to have to wear it. Sounded good on the front end, but now it's actually costing people uh, quality of life and money. And now people aren't so enamored with the, this, these visions. And so a couple snippets from the article says the German Greens are not in a happy place. Bruised by claims of nepotism at the highest levels of Habeck's economics, quote, super ministry, unquote, and running into heavy resistance with its climate policies, the party has slipped back to fourth in the polls behind the hard right alternative for Germany. And its most pressing and obvious problem is Habeck's attempt to ban the installation of new oil and gas boilers in households from 2024. So that's a big deal right now. Again, I would let my German uh, listeners weigh in on that. But, you know, again, I, I, I always tell people, if you want to understand your future, if we go down this forced transition, energy transition in the U.S., you have laboratories that uh, that you can look at that have already done this or are trying to do it, and you can see the problems they're having, i.e. California, i.e. Uh, different places in Europe, like Germany specifically. So uh, this is what awaits you in California and New York and some other places. New York's talking about banning all gas and oil burning, all these same thing that Germany's doing, and they're finding the same thing. Where do you, How are you going to get the money to replace all this stuff? Who's going to do it because the technicians don't exist? None of the so it's just like these fantasies with no idea how we're going to get there. You know, it's like this sounds good on paper, but how do you actually implement it in real life? And none of that was actually given any thought because you know why would uh, you know a person that is a author and poet know anything about transitioning energy? He's not an engineer. He's not a energy expert. He's just somebody that feels good about green energy and feels like if we really care and think about it good along, it'll happen. But that's not how things work in the real material world. Um, resources are needed. Trade-offs have to happen. Um, things don't work the way you want them to in real life sometimes, even if they pencil out on a spreadsheet. And so people are finding that out. And now people are saying, well, wait a minute, uh, this is costing me my job, possibly my standard of living and my quality of life. And we see the consequences of this are not what the people said they would be that are, were proposing it. And there's pushback. And I expect you'll see more of this. That's why I think we're at peak ESG. The further we go down the path with this stuff, the more obvious it becomes that it's a cluster bungle. So that's it for this week, guys. This last slide. Uh, appreciate you uh, listening in. Again, um, super bullish on uranium. Something's happening in the uranium market over the last couple of weeks, like really came alive. I don't know if it was just a short covering rally or just a little burst uh, based on this uh, news that came out that Namibia wasn't going to, but there was a lot of that what the Namibians weren't going to nationalize anything. But uh, I think something else is happening. It seems like, uh, you know, we were in a bear market or nothing was really happening. We were in stasis for like over a year. And this is what happens, right? Then, uh, you know, the amount of term contracts now is accelerating. And the uh, fuel buyers are waking up and starting to close contracts. And now the realization is going to, excuse me, set in that, uh, you know, we have a musical chair situation and you better you better buy your stuff while you have the chance because there may not be any for you a couple few years out. So I expect uh, we'll see how that goes through the summer. Um, but we also, you know, trying to figure out this oil market has been a little bit difficult because we have physical demand is there, uh, is recovered from pre-pandemic levels and in some cases exceeding that. We're seeing these projections for record travel during the summer and yet we have the oil price struggling, you know, so as it vies with these recessionary disinflationary forces, which have been in place for a while now. So we'll have to see how that arm wrestling match ends also. Again, you know, we look past or try to look past or understand, like we've talked about before, that there will be cyclical, you know, short six to 18 month periods where we will go sideways or down. 
because of economics and liquidity and sentiment, but in the context of a decade plus long secular bull market. So we looked look to that. Again, keep your powder dry. I'm keeping my powder dry. I'm not really making a lot of purchases. I'm trying to look past, you know, eventually uh, the central banks of the world are going to reverse their policies and uh, we'll be in another up cycle of liquidity. And I would suggest then that we'll really understand uh, the effects of underinvestment as the prices of these things, as, as central banks reliquify and print money, you can't print more resources. You can't print more seventh generation drill ships. You can't print more product tankers. And so we'll see how that plays out over the next several years. Okay, guys, that's it for this week. Thanks for, for uh, listening and we'll talk to you next week.